Hmm. Let's try... That doesn't seem quite right. Hmm. Not quite. No. There. Hold it there. Underneath all its wonder and whimsy, Toem is a game that feels profoundly down to earth. You play as a young photographer who leaves home on a journey to photograph the mysterious phenomenon known as Toem. But to call capturing this event your objective would be to miss the point. The game's subtitle is A Photo Adventure. To borrow an old cliché, that adventure, that journey, is more central to the game than the destination. And to iterate on an old cliché, that journey, like the best of journeys, is peppered with several smaller, more personal micro-journeys. On your path to the mountain of Kiruberg where Toem takes place, you'll make stops at various Scandinavian-inspired locales. Your goal in each region is to collect enough stamps on your bus card so you can catch a free ride to the next one. Stamps are earned by helping out the local NPCs with their many quirky requests, most of which involve exploration and photography. Your camera is really the only tool you have and need through Toem, and though it can be upgraded with a horn to get characters' attention, a tripod to take photos from afar, and a cool set of frames and filters, the core gameplay loop remains the same. Explore these forests, these seas, this bustling city, and snap some nice photos. Toem was developed by Something We Made, a Swedish indie studio of about four people. Although the game is black and white, its cast of characters is as colorful as they come. The quests they give you are as varied and diverse as they are zany. Members of the Photographer's Guild assign you local photo challenges, some of which act like riddles. An eye in a periscope introduces himself as a secret agent and tasks you with photographing a mysterious figure who's been spotted lurking around the regions. A monster enthusiast asks you to track down four elusive mythical monsters hiding across the world. You don a pair of ghost glasses that grants you the ability to see ghosts who have similar lingering requests they need your help with before they can move on. A J. Jonah Jameson-like editor hires you to be his photojournalist complete with a reporter hat that gets you access to events you couldn't go to before. I ended up feeling more captivated by each of these quests than I was by my overall goal, and I became especially invested in finding the four myths. The photos you take for each of these characters are saved to your handy dandy album, which is further divided into three tabs. There's the standard tab, where you store all your personal memories and projects, the Favorites tab, for those photos you like just a little bit more. And finally, a Compendium tab. See, there are dozens of animals, birds, bugs, famous pets, and maybe even an extra mythical creature or two scattered across Toem's world. The Compendium is preloaded with labels so you know what critters to look out for, and it automatically stores whatever photos you take of them when you finally find them. Although this isn't required for collecting stamps, it adds an extra fun little goal for you to work towards if you're especially invested in the game. Which I was. I'm a little fascinated with the how long to beat stats for Toem. It lists a little over 3 hours on average for the main story, and 5 hours 30 minutes for a completionist run. A leisurely paced completionist run is listed at 8 hours. That's not shocking. This is a tight, short, cozy game, and it's easy to picture someone knocking it out in a single sitting. What I was shocked by was my own playtime in comparison. I clocked out of a 100% complete save file at about 13 hours. 13 hours! So what happened? Well, part of the answer is that my playtime included the Basto update, which added a free new post-game region to the game. The second part of the answer is the most embarrassing. I got more stuck on some of the puzzles than I care to admit, because I started overthinking them. But I think there's actually something bigger happening here. I really, really liked overthinking things in this game. As you may have gleaned from the video's title, I love scrapbooking in video games. I like when a game lets me sort my memories of it in an order and style that makes sense to me. I organized my album obsessively in Toem, taking care to title and label each of my pictures so I knew what they were, where they were, and when and how I'd taken them. When possible, I tried to create symmetries in how I arranged one set of photos next to another. The process was strangely therapeutic for me. Moreover, being able to name these pictures gave me an additional creative outlet that I appreciated.
It's been over two years now since I started my personal little project, photographing NPCs in video games. I'd started this in part because I've always loved people watching, and in part because I wanted to use all these cool, fancy new video game photo modes to take portrait shots of people other than just my player characters. I talk about this more in other videos, but this way of approaching games has given me a new outlook on all the different ways NPCs can fill a world. In Toem, though, photographing NPCs is the game, capturing cool details is the point. The title already makes it easy to slip into the role it's designed for you, but for me, it felt so second nature that I started to overanalyze other things to compensate. <laughs> Toem is happy to accept whatever photo you take of an assigned subject as fulfillment of you capturing the subject itself. Usually, there's no expectation that you will compose shots in any particularly exciting ways, or through any specific filters. All of that's just up to you. But for me, obsessing over what the right angle and filter and frame and name for any given photo would spark me the most joy ended up feeling really fulfilling. It created a personal connection with each photo, and with each microcosm of Toem's ecosystem that I encountered. Some of them were for quests, others were just for myself. Your sense of personalized discovery is enhanced, time and again, by Jamal Green and Launchable Sox's soft, serene, and soulful soundtrack. You can play songs you unlock on your hike lady. Yes, that is a Walkman joke, but every now and then, they'll come on by themselves too. Music, like photography, can act as a marker of specific moments in your life. The dev team finds ways of making the two go hand in hand anyway. Puzzles sometimes involve characters changing something through music, in ways that can feel satisfying to riddle over. I'm going to talk about my own experience of the game for a minute, and if any of what I've said sounded interesting to you and you want to play the game yourself, this is where you can either come back later or skip to a timestamp. I won't show you the Toem phenomenon itself, you deserve to see it for yourself. But I'll talk about multiple details I noticed throughout the game, including in the ending and epilogue. So here's the timestamp. Toem is available on PC, PS5, and Switch. I'll be right here. In a frozen limbo state. Awaiting your return. Kind of like a photograph! So here's my album. As I mentioned, some of these are for quest givers, the others are for me. At times, I had a hard time distinguishing between which was going to be for which, and that's where my confusion would kick in. I started to overthink things. Take my favorite example. In Log City, a civilian stands next to his car looking excessively stressed out. He has a parking ticket because he failed to park inside the lines. Was it that big of a deal? My quest log mentioned someone having a tough week, so my gamer brain assumed that this meant that I could help this person. So I started scouring the city, and I found a funny scene that went hand in hand. A police car double parked well outside the lines. It's so much worse. And of course the cops haven't ticketed themselves. Could I shoot this as evidence of their hypocrisy? Well, that civilian actually doesn't ask you for photos, so you can't show him this situation. And he doesn't give you a stamp, because he's not a quest giver. He may or may not be tangential to a different quest line, but the police car scene? It's just a cool bit of environmental storytelling I found, purely by virtue of being thorough. I didn't get a stamp for it, and there was no extrinsic reward. I got something intrinsic though. An anecdote. An amusing little side-by-side -side comparison that had to be deliberate. And this was as valuable to me as progress would be. Toem is littered with fun details like this for the eagle-eyed. While perhaps not as overtly as a game like Cuphead, it does feel partially inspired by old monochrome cartoons. Kind of in terms of art direction, but mainly in the animation and sense of humor. Little bats show up in photographs of the vampire in Basto, even though you'd never see them in the actual frame while shooting. <laughs> Most players will find the strange radio tower in Kiruberg, where an old man asks you to find the mysterious cubes that are causing strange, cosmic phenomena around the world. 
What I want to highlight here, though, is what you see if you spare a moment to study the tower itself. A derelict old building, held together by a single, oversized... Band-Aid? Meanwhile, in Log City, you're tasked with finding a set number of wall murals and graffiti paintings. Although you don't have to find all of them, they're each interesting in their own way, and I recommend keeping going. I won't spoil you my favorite one, but it requires you to think a little differently about perspective. You can miss it completely and still be fine. But there's a special kind of pleasure to finding something you didn't need to, no? There's more. So much more. So, here, I'll leave you be for a second. Enjoy the soundtrack. I also mentioned the horn earlier. All characters, quote unquote, react to it with a simple squash. What's cool though is that a select few are uniquely startled by the thing. Wait, what? Hey! No! Stop that! By the way, I found this out while editing. If you visit that Sunday swan on a Sunday, it'll be dressed in its Sunday best. Your hats can also influence the popular fashion of Log City. Though if you try to suggest a weird one, like your diving helmet, well... Sometimes, overthinking the game's puzzles even pays off. To give an example, I found a slider puzzle in a cave and couldn't find the slider controls. But the answer seemed straightforward enough. So I drew the solution out on paper and figured out what I would need to do just in the wrong order. That's why I never minded getting puzzles wrong in the game. Experimentation and discovery are key. Sometimes overthinking yields results, and at other times it yields a fun story. As I mentioned earlier, observations like this are intrinsic rewards. They feel good to find, and that has to be enough. What the album does, though, is give you a chance to store those memories on the same level, and in the same place, as the ones that you got something material out of. And eventually, the lines just start to blur, and all that's left is a collection of cool stories. It doesn't matter which ones gave you a stamp. The more important question is, which ones made you laugh? Which made you smile? Which made you go, huh? And which made you think back on memories you thought you'd lost? You'll notice that a lot of characters I've told you about are artists and scientists and adventurers and entrepreneurs. They're all out to discover things, and they're excited to learn, and they aren't shy about expressing wonder even when a test goes wrong. When I called the game Down to Earth earlier, I was being genuine. Taken together, you and your new friends make a strong case for why the arts and the sciences are inextricably linked. Discovery leads to creativity, leads to discovery, etc. One of the final quests in the game is given to you by the mountain explorer, who's looking for wall paintings by an old civilization called the Ancients. You track them down and bring snapshots to her, images of images now filtered through technology from centuries later. She interprets them to tell you a story from an age before cameras, when we scrapbooked on walls and documented our discoveries in chalk and dye. These are our histories etched into the earth, stories about how we shared stories, sitting over our first light. Fire. But as we traveled, socialized, and traveled some more, we found something else. High atop Kiruberg. You're going to find it too.
This is why virtual photography, aka video game photography, can be so cool. We're all playing the same games and working towards the same goals, but we're zooming in on the details that personally intrigue us. And we're using it to share stories. There's still an important distinction here though, between non-diegetic photo modes and diegetic camera modes. Non-diegetic essentially means that the photo mode exists outside the game's established canon. It is a thing you, the player, are doing, by freezing the frame and manipulating the camera in some interesting way. Toem's camera, on the flip side, is diegetic. You're a photographer! You photograph things! And your subjects aren't picked out of freeze frames. They just exist out in the world, and you capture them mid-action. AAA games like Ratchet & Clank or Ghost of Tsushima may have robust photo modes that allow for a great deal of creative freedom, but there's a special kind of tangibility to a photo that is taken within a game's world without total control, especially if you have an in-universe album to go with your camera. It's the difference between a stack of old Polaroids in a shoebox, messy and monochromatic, but material. Physical prints you can't seem to hold at a right angle and a hard drive full of HD photos, rigid in their beauty and sometimes just a bit too perfect. Photos are memories made material. They're artifacts of a specific time period in your life that you generate, store, and maybe look back on in a few years. It's worth highlighting that Toem doesn't export your in-game photos into a PNG like other photo modes do. These images only exist to be viewed within the game itself. Normally, I don't love when I'm just straight up denied that option, but I think it works here, because Toem's album is such a specific kind of memory vault. Photography is the game's main focus, so if you're going to look back on your captures, it asks that you return your focus to the game in turn. Open the app, physically dig out the album, and flip through those pages. The appropriate ambiance rustles in the background. When I think of scrapbooking in games, this is what comes to mind for me. In-universe albums, journals, portfolios that you put together yourself. They act as unique records of your time with the game, within the game. I may adore that cool shot I took in Marvel Spider-Man. Twitter may decide it loves it, but Spider-Man himself will never see that shot. The photographer in Toem, meanwhile, will gleefully show their album to friends and family around the game world. They might even sneak a photo of themselves onto an employee of the month wall. Or donate a fancy one to an art museum. The album isn't just a display of creative output, it's also a source for playful input. When a royal family member invited me to photograph their sandcastle competition, and the prince kept photobombing me, I went ahead and used filters to mess with him back. Then I submitted those photos to the queen. She doesn't comment on her annoying son, but... Look, I just wanted to tell you this story because I had fun. Intrinsic rewards. Let's step away from the game for a second and reflect on the bigger picture. Speaking personally, in-game scrapbooking helps make my memories of these photos feel more realized. I have a stronger recollection of the specifics of my time with Gravity Rush 2, Kingdom Hearts 3, and Final Fantasy XV than I do of other games I played around comparable times. Because all three feature albums that show off my journeys, with pictures organized in a chronology that's specific to me. I remember Iris joining my party as a guest in FF15, and the way the five of us crammed into that car together, and how Prompto would show us our photos with her each night. I remember returning to Olympus between other worlds, and stumbling across KH3's secret forge for the first time. I remember Goofy making a bunch of silly faces standing next to Zeus, leader of the gods. And I remember Gravity Rush 2, closing out with a tumble down memory lane, my own photos scrolling down the screen, parallel with the credits. It feels like the characters here, the NPCs, are in on the joke. The memories are a shared experience we all lived through within the game world. KH3 even features a series of collectibles that relies on you using your camera. You photograph various hidden Mickeys scattered throughout the game. Rather than just checkmark when you found one, the game's journal saves your photo of the emblem as proof you found it. It makes your experiences of finding these collectibles a bit more personal and memorable and even sentimental. 
Narrative-focused games often feature in-universe journals to describe the collectibles you pick up throughout your adventure. It's their own way of tracking those smaller micro-journeys along your path I mentioned earlier. When you look back through that journal, though, part of the story is lost. The context of where you physically found a collectible might have been as important as the story of the collectible itself. For a lot of games, I've noticed that I'm able to appreciate an item description a lot more if I read it immediately upon finding the item in question. If I wait too long, or go too far, I lose sight of how I found that item so the text offers me a little less information. There's no grounding. I know what happened and when, but I may not remember where. When I have direct input over a scrapbook myself though, I can pick and choose not just what I remember, but how I remember it, with whatever surrounding context I deem helpful. So let's return to Toem. I've told you about my journey, and all the reasons I was so moved and humored by it. I've talked about how that journey offered something special, every bit as important as the destination. But I left something out, and I'm about to close by talking about the ending, so again, spoiler warning. The game is finished when you witness Toem, yes, but the credits close out with pictures you took yourself along the path. They return the focus to everyone you met. Everything you did along the way. The Basto update takes this a step further with its big playable epilogue. Now, your photo adventure doesn't end with Toem itself. It ends in the way those first witnesses who saw Toem came to spread word of Toem, with stories by the campfire of long and personal journeys shared through pictures. This time, it's not through wall paintings. It's through a collection of photos in a little album, put together by a little photographer who could. The cool thing is, Toem is Something We Made's first commercial title, and you can feel the team experimenting and discovering new things themselves as you play along. Their past games are freely available on their website, by the way. The first is Door Knocker, which is set in a maze where your only tool is a door you can toss around. You pick a wall, you install it, and hope it leads to the next room. But sometimes the next room is full of enemies. Then you have to get creative with using your door in a fight. Their second title, Glide, as you fly and flow through a desert world of cool, arcane architecture. Toem is different from both. Although it combines creativity with calmness, it adds a lot more to the mix, as I've just talked about. It leaves me excited for more from them in the future. So thank you, Team Toem. And for all of you still watching, thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe if you want. And if you don't, there's mints by the door. You could have a mint if you subscribe too. That's cool.